Shalom from Israel to all of the Daystar viewers around the world. I'm Moshe Bartzvi, the producer and founder of Israel Now News. We at Israel Now News are dedicated to bringing you the full story and the truth about Israel from Israel. It's written in the Holy Bible when David said in Psalm 25, 5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And God says in Zechariah 8:16, These are the things that you shall do. Speak out the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment to peace in your gates. And always search for the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8:31. I hope you enjoyed the program. God bless you from Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Aaron Viner. In our top story, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to thwart Iran's nuclear ambitions before it's too late. In a candid interview with the CBS television program Face the Nation, he warned that the recent change of power in Iran does not alter the threat that it poses to Israel. Netanyahu said there is a new president in Iran who is criticizing his predecessor for being a wolf in wolf's clothing, while the strategy of the new leader is to be a wolf in sheep's clothing. Tehran is reportedly advancing a plan whereby it will agree to temporarily halt enriching uranium to 20 percent in exchange for the lifting of sanctions. Netanyahu warned that the Iranians have invested a lot in upgrading centrifuges and have the technical ability to replenish their stockpiles within a few weeks. He said the tactic of the new Iranian president is to smile and build a bomb. But as the Prime Minister of Israel, I'm determined to do whatever is necessary to defend my country, the one and only Jewish state, from a regime that threatens it with annihilation. With each passing day, Israel is in greater danger, according to the former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, John Bolton, who told the Jerusalem Post that he believes Israel should have attacked Iran yesterday. Bolton said that he understands why Israel wants to take defensive action against nuclear facilities in the Islamic Republic and that the situation becomes more dangerous the more time goes by. Bolton also said that during his first term in office, U.S. President Barack Obama warned Israel that the United States would not resupply the Jewish state with any weaponry used to attack Tehran, but was forced to change his stance following overwhelming congressional support for Israel's right to defend itself against a nuclear Iran. News syndicates have been abuzz with reports of an alleged Israeli military strike on a Syrian weapons facility last week. Israel declined comment on the incident, but the British Sunday Times reported that Israel struck the arms depot with a missile fired from a Dolphin-class submarine. However, CNN quoted unnamed U.S. officials who said the weapons factory was hit by the Israeli Air Force in close coordination with the United States. The destroyed facility was storing Russian-made anti-ship missiles, which Israel views as a threat to its security. A Russian news outlet reported that Israel launched airstrikes from a Turkish airbase. The English-language Russian news site stated that Israeli planes left a military base inside Turkey and approached the port city of Latakia from the sea to make sure that they stayed out of Syrian airspace. This week marks one year since a suicide bomber detonated an explosive on a bus filled with Israeli tourists at the Burgas airport in Bulgaria. Five Israelis and the local bus driver were killed, and 32 others were wounded in the terror attack. According to Bulgarian officials, there is well-grounded evidence that Lebanon's Hezbollah terror organization was behind the bombing. There are several stages of bereavement according to Jewish tradition, including the gathering of family and friends of the deceased to unveil a gravestone on the first anniversary of their loved one's death. The custom marks the end of the period during which mourners refrain from celebrations of any kind. After that time, remembrance takes place annually on the date of the loved one's death. Egypt is facing a wheat shortage of biblical proportions. Egypt is the world's largest importer of wheat, buying about 10 million tons of grain each year. According to the former Egyptian Minister of Supplies, the country has just two months of wheat remaining. Israel welcomed the formation of a new political party last week. 
The Sons of the New Testament faction consists of Zionist Christian Arab citizens who want to establish an identity of their own separate from around 90 percent of other Israeli Arabs who are Muslims. The group intends to increase awareness of Christian Arabs who wish to serve in the Israel Defense Forces and to protect them from any threats or persecution from the Muslim community. The Knesset met last week to discuss ways to encourage Arab enlistment in the IDF and protect those who do serve the country. Since the start of the Arab Spring Revolution, there has been an increase of Christian Arab enlistment in Israel's army. Many say that violence against Christians in Arab countries inspired them to align themselves with the only country in the Middle East that protects their right to practice Christianity freely, the democratic state of Israel. Mobs of Palestinians protested outside the PLO headquarters in Ramallah last week against a series of meetings held between Palestinian and Jewish leaders. The angry crowd called the talks a step toward normalization with Israel, a move which they view as treason since they are committed to armed struggle with the Jewish state. The anti-normalization campaign is led by Palestinians who wish to continue their war of terror against Israel and prevent Palestinian leaders from meeting with Israeli politicians who wish to forge a peace agreement. The organizers of the campaign are demanding the resignation of any moderate Palestinian willing to negotiate with Israel. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu telephoned Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas at the start of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan to personally deliver his regards on the occasion. The Israeli leader used the opportunity to encourage Abbas to negotiate with his nation so that the two peoples can live in peace. After sending his best wishes for Ramadan, Netanyahu expressed his hope that the two men will have the opportunity to speak to one another not only on the holy days and that it is very important to begin direct peace talks. Israel has made great efforts to accommodate its Arab population during the holy month of Ramadan. Israeli security has allowed Muslims free passage to holy sites and even restricted Jewish access to these areas. The Cave of the Patriarchs in Hebron is usually divided into separate sections for Jews and Muslims. Last week, Israel allowed Muslims exclusive access to the entire site. When Jewish worshipers were permitted to return, they were devastated to find that the holy site had been desecrated by the Muslims. Two mezuzot were stolen and the entire area was littered with garbage. The Cave of the Patriarchs is the second most holy site in Judaism. It is the burial place of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebekah, and Leah. Israel celebrated the temporary release of Adele Bitone, the three-year-old little girl who was critically wounded when the car driven by her mother Adva collided with two other vehicles last March after being hit by rocks thrown by Palestinian terrorists. Medical staff determined that Adele was well enough to spend the Sabbath at home with her parents, although she has returned to the Beit Levenstein Hospital to continue with her lengthy recovery. Her parents expressed gratitude to God for her improvement and the chance to spend the Sabbath at home together as a family. Israeli partners Delik Drilling and Avner Exploration have announced that the Karish offshore gas field holds about 12.7 million barrels of natural gas condensate. Karish is the smallest of three gas fields found just over 50 miles off Israel's shore. The discovery of the Tamar and Leviathan gas fields has made Israel a potential gas exporter and has given the Jewish state the possibility of energy independence. Israel announced last week that it plans to export about 40 percent of the gas, keeping the rest for domestic consumption. Gideon Tadmor, the chief executive officer of Avner Exploration, said this is further proof of the strength of Israel's energy market and the importance of continued exploration. Israeli archaeologists unearthed one of the most significant discoveries in recent times. The partial remains of an ancient Egyptian sphinx, determined to be more than 4,000 years old, were found at Tel Khatzor. One of the team leaders, Dr. Sharon Zuckerman, said that the statue bears the hieroglyphic name of Pharaoh Mankura, who ruled Egypt some 2,530 years before the Common Era and built one of the famous pyramids at Giza. Other inscriptions on the statue reveal that it originally resided in the Egyptian city of Heliopolis. The archaeologists are expressing their curiosity as to how the Sphinx was brought to Israel and why it was so badly damaged. 
Several hypothesize that it may have been intentionally destroyed during attempts to purge the nation of Israel from idolatry. Hummus has been declared the official dip of the NFL. Sabra Hummus, owned by PepsiCo, is now the official dip sponsor of the National Football League. Ronen Zohar, the Israeli CEO of Sabra Hummus, said most people in the U.S. have never tasted hummus, but when people actually try it, they change their minds about it. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in yet another beautiful day on the rooftop studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Eliezer Moody Zandberg world chairman of Kerna Yassod, United Israel Appeal. Moody, thank you for being on the show. My pleasure. How are you, Josh? Great. Hey, Moody, we've known each other for years. You were a member of Knesset. You were a minister in the government of Israel. You were one of the founders of the Knesset Christian Allies Caucus. And now you're the chairman of Kerna Yassod. Tell our viewers, what is Kerna Yassod? Kerna Yassod, uh, the full name is uh, Kerna Yassod, United Israel Appeal, is an entity that was formed back in the early 20s of the 20th century in order to fundraise to support the return of the Jewish people back to their homeland. As we all know, the Zionist movement started at the very end of the 19th century with the idea that it's about time the Jews should return to their homeland. And after that, the pioneers started to arrive to Israel. Soon after, we, we learned that in order to assist those people who come to Israel and in order to facilitate their arrival to Israel, we need to collect funds from the Jewish people. We need to approach our brothers and sisters all around the world and ask them to give a contribution in order to enable the pioneers and later on all the waves of immigrants, the Jews who return to their homeland, to do it. Keren Aesod is the fundraising arm that sponsors the activities mainly of the Jewish agency who is in charge of the return of those people back to the homeland for years after years, decades after decades. You know, Karen Aesod is responsible for some of the major founding movements of the country, the, the air carrier, the electric company. Tell us a little about how was Karen Aesod able to create all these institutions? Kerna Esod was a fundraising to build the infrastructure of the country, the basis of this country, even before the country was created. You know that some of the major activities of Kerna Esod were done when this country was still ruled by the, the British, under the British mandate. Uh, if you take the immigration, we funded the illegal immigration boats that came from Europe after the Holocaust with Holocaust survivors that were refused by the British to, 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 to come to Israel. Uh, on another direction, we funded the creation of different settlements, kibbutzim and moshavim all around the country. Even the city of Eilat was uh, created with the funds that Keren Esod supplied. Uh, another element was the creation of what we call the infrastructure. The, we, we landed the money to the electricity company when it was created. Uh, we helped to fundraise uh, for the creation of El Al, the Israeli airline carrier team, the shipping company that were both government uh, entities in the, in the beginning, in the early days. We did that by approaching the Jewish communities around the world, by asking the Jewish people to support and to assist, and uh, the heart were open, the ears were open, and of course the generosity was shown. This country, and I say it again and again, all the time, this country belongs to the Jewish people. No matter where you live at this moment, either you already made Aliyah, you moved to Israel, or you're still in another place, this is your country. This is why all Jewish people look into funding the creation of or building this country as a national mission that we all need to share together. You know, Moody, you've been a very big supporter of Jews and Christians working together. Why do you think Christians have a part to play in this fulfillment of biblical prophecy? I don't think so. The Bible says so. Uh, if you read what the Bible says, we are living in times that the prophecies are being executed. These are the times that the biblical prophecies have been fulfilled. And I think that everybody that shares Christian uh, Judeo values, who believes in the Bible, uh, should, and uh, if only if he wants, be a partner in uh, the creation 
of this state of Israel in the return of the Jewish people back to their homeland and the building of, uh, of this homeland again as a Jewish state. So for us, when Christians uh, um, uh, appeal to us or uh, approach us and say we would like to be partners, we welcome them. We see those Christians as our brothers and we believe that uh, together we can make it happen even faster. You know, you mentioned some of the foundation of the state of Israel. Karen Hayasod literally means the foundation fund. But today in modern Israel, what part does Karen Hayasod play in modern times? Well, we still uh, believe that uh, there is a lot to be done uh, and uh, we are very proud in our country and our economy, but uh, the tasks that we have on our shoulders are bigger than the, uh, the possibility, the, the, the pie that needs to be divided between the different needs starting with security, going to education, supporting uh, the elderly, etc. The pie is very big, and, uh, but the needs are bigger. And uh, this is where Karen Isol is also involved through the activities of the Jewish Agency, with the bringing of the people to Israel, with the absorption of uh, the people as they arrive here, with helping uh, other people here, beginning with young people, uh, uh, ending with the elderly people, with supporting the periphery of Israel. We are involved in all that and we will continue to be involved in all that. And we see the funds that we raise from uh, all around the world as a symbol of partnership between the Jewish communities around the world and the Jewish community that lives in our homeland. Mundi, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? I think that uh, it is important for us when you look around and see all the problems that, uh, that, uh, that we, uh, we might read about in, uh, in the media to think that we are living in beautiful times. The prophecy of the prophets of the Bible is being executed in front of our eyes. Think that a uh, hundred years ago this could not happen. We, the Jewish people, return to our homeland. We have an independent state. Jews can come here and Jews are coming here. And we are talking now in Jerusalem. We are talking now from a roof of a building in, of the capital of Israel. These are the best times. Together, we can do our best in order to make it happen. Thank you, Mitty, for being on the show. And My thank pleasure. you for tuning in to As a Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Those who dreamed about the Jewish state, those who wrought the historical miracle and against all odds established a state, those who arrived in the homeland to their new home, those who propelled Israel forward step after step. I have no doubt that this expanded partnership with our many Christian supporters will greatly strengthen Israel in the years ahead. And I want to thank you all for being part of that historic effort and that historic partnership. May God bless all of Israel's friends throughout the world. May God bless you. Up next, shining light from Israel. Throughout the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Palestinian representatives and their supporters have systematically used the UN's main institutions to launch high-profile investigations against Israel for alleged war crimes. However, these charges have been proven time and again to be false. Example number one. In April 2002, after Israel was struck with a wave of suicide bombing attacks, Israeli troops entered the Jenin refugee camp in the West Bank, described by Palestinians as the capital of suicide attacks. Palestinian leaders accused Israel of carrying out a massacre. The massacre in Jenin and the massacre in the city of Nablus. Sai Barakat called for an international commission of inquiry and claimed at least 500 Palestinians were killed. Yasser Abedrabu contended that among the 500, many were women and children. The UN took the Palestinian leaders at their word, 
Secretary General Kofi Annan spoke about grave violations by the IDF and dispatched UN investigators. Yet, after the damage caused to Israel's reputation, the UN investigation concluded that the accusations were false. There was never a massacre in Jenin. Example number two. In December 2008, after constant Palestinian rocket fire on Israel, the Israel Defense Forces entered Gaza in an attempt to protect its southern cities. Palestinians accused Israel of deliberately targeting civilians. A fact-finding team appointed by the UN Human Rights Council and headed by Justice Richard Goldstone initially accepted the Palestinian accusations. However, Justice Goldstone later retracted the main claim against Israel. Example number three. In May 2010, the Israeli Navy stopped a flotilla of six ships on their way to Gaza. Israel was accused of imposing an illegal naval blockade and denying civilians access to food and humanitarian aid. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon empowered the Palmer Commission to investigate the claims. The Palmer report concluded that the blockade was legal under international law and that there was no humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Moreover, Israel did not block humanitarian aid from entering Gaza by land. In the month prior to the flotilla alone, over 17,000 tons of aid entered Gaza. The markets of Gaza were, in fact, full of fresh produce. These are just three well-known examples. The Palestinians' fabrications against Israel have been proven time and again to be a systematic abuse of international institutions aimed at discrediting and delegitimizing the state of Israel. However, hijacking the agenda of the United Nations by Palestinians comes with a price. As early as November 2006, the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan criticized the UN Human Rights Council. Since the beginning of their work, they have focused almost entirely on Israel, and there are other crisis situations like Sudan, where they have not been able to say a word. The systematic exploitation of international humanitarian law by Palestinians comes at the expense of others in need. It erodes the credibility of UN bodies, and it must come to an end. Please stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. Welcome to our new episode of the ICEJ report. And today we are together with our international director, Juha Ketola. Welcome, Juha. Thank you, Jürgen. Juha, today we want to talk about West Africa. It's a huge part of the African continent. And until a few years ago, the Christian embassy in this part of the world was working basically in two countries, which was Nigeria and Ghana. But then three years together, you and I, we were traveling through uh, Finland. Mm -hmm. And in one of those little land country churches, suddenly the pastor got up and he prophesied, tell me what happened on that evening. Jürgen, I get goosebumps every time when we talk about this. Now this man of God, this pastor came up and he prophesied over ICEJ ministry and he said to us that the Lord will open 10 new Arab Muslim countries for our ministry and uh, those countries will be the ones that at the time of the prophecy, Israel was for them an abomination. And uh, just for you to understand, as you are listening to us, God did amazing things over, the, over this last couple of years, or even months, and God opened doors for us into countries which we never thought He would open doors for us. Tell us what happened over the last month. It's exactly like Jesus says, uh, uh, ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. Yes. Now nations started to open up for us. Yeah. First, in uh, one of the Muslim countries in the Northern Africa, almost 100% Muslim country. Hmm. But then the Lord started opening us more doors in Western Africa, yeah. Sierra Leone, Senegal, Niger. And you know, these countries, Niger, it's more than 90% Muslim. Yes. Senegal, more than 90% Muslim. Sierra Leone, 60% Muslim. And all of, in all of those countries, we have fully operational branch with national directors and board and everything and the whole body of Christ 
with our vision. And in Ivory Coast, we had to close down the Ivory Coast branch a number of years ago because of the civil war which was taking place in that country. But we could open it also after we went from Niger, we went over to Ivory Coast and we could re-establish that branch. Tell us what happened there. It's the resurrection life of Jesus. Now, what happened in Ivory Coast was that uh, we went in again after the war and we're connected through our Western Africa representative, Reverend Abdul Maika. Yes. We were connected to the whole body of Christ in Ivory Coast and all of them came together because we have a message of reconciliation. It, we were able to bring unity and then to speak also to the national uh, leadership of Ivory Coast uh, as one voice and, and, and uh, as our ministry and also in Niger. The national leadership was, uh, we met with them. And it was all over the media that people spoke about the Christian embassy came to our country to bring reconciliation to our nation. But uh, the Lord spoke to you over the last few weeks about other countries where we want to enter into. Tell us what, were, what is the vision for us to go forward in the next couple of months? The Holy Spirit is carrying us according to the word that he gave us. Yes. More doors are opening the Muslim nations. And, and I believe it will not be just 10 nations. No, it will be more. And then the whole Africa. We have now really uh, a real, not ideal, not, not, this is not a disillusionment. This is a, a reality. We have doors open, people there in these countries, Burkina Faso, Benin, Togo, Guinea, Mali, Gambia. Some have 90% Islamic population, I read here. Of course, because the Lord spoke to us about yes. it. Yes. <laughs> so it's amazing. But we need, uh, we need funds to be, to much, be honest about it. How much do we need? Uh, the, the budget that we have, it's about $50,000. We need $50,000, and I would say only $50,000. Well, as you have heard, we need $50,000 to accomplish this in the coming months. And let me tell you what you heard today in this last few minutes. This is nothing short of a miracle what God is doing in the African continent today. And you can become part of exactly this exciting development what is taking place in Africa. I want to personally invite you today to help us to go through those open doors. We feel in our spirit we don't know how long those doors will be open. We need to move fast. We need your help. It's only $50,000 and we can reach entire nations, six nations in the continent of Africa. Please prayerfully consider to partner with us and to support Israel. We are your embassy here in Jerusalem. May the Lord bless you out of Zion. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan Elrom. And I'm Erin Viner, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all your updates on Israel.